Let us pray. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah, the man of war, his mercy endureth forever and ever. Oh, praise his holy name. Amen. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jehovah, the man of war. His mercy endureth forever and ever. Oh, praise his holy name. Amen. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jehovah, the man of war. His mercy endureth forever and ever. Oh, praise his holy name. Our Father and our God, we want to bless your holy name. For this very special edition of the gathering together of your children from all institutions of higher learning, we thank you for the theme for this year, the mighty arrow. We give you all glory and honor for preserving your children. We thank you for all you've done for them thus far. And we are praying, Lord God Almighty, that you will do even greater things for them today so that they will live back to their various campuses anointed, supported, empowered to the glory of your holy name. Wherever they may be, gather together to listen to your word. Please, Lord God Almighty, reach out to them and do something very special in all their lives. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I am greeting all of you, uh, beloved children, from the various institutions of learning. And you, you are welcome to this year's uh, very special edition of your gathering together. Wherever you may be, I'm sure you know the Almighty God is there with you and he will bless you and do something marvelous in your lives in Jesus' name. Now, you've chosen a very interesting topic, Mighty Arrows, and so we will just take our text from Psalm 127 and read verses 4 and 5 Psalm 127 4 and 5 As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man so are children of the youth happy is the man that has his quiver full of them they shall not be ashamed but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. There are two words here, mighty and arrows. The word mighty is easy to understand. Mighty is, is uh, the word you use for someone who is not ordinarily strong, but very strong. When you say someone is mighty, we, we know that fellow is extremely strong. So we won't be wasting time talking about the adjective. We will simply focus on the noun. Arrows. 
When you go through the scriptures, you will discover that in the whole armor of God, there are many defensive weapons. Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 14 to 17, Ephesians 6, 14 to 17, tells us about the gathering of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the boot of preparation of gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and uh, if there's only one offensive weapon mentioned at all, it is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All the others, the Gadur of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the boot that we wear for the gospel of peace. All of them are defensive. They are to protect your body. The only weapon that they say you can use to fight is the sword of the spirit. So the question then comes... Where does the arrow fit in? Well, it will be easy to know because we know that the arrow, of course, in the, I mean, without any doubt, is an offensive weapon. And the arrow, even in some cases, uh, can be probably more useful than the sword. You see why? Because attack is the best form of defense. Uh, there are some enemies who don't want to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well, if we talk about the sword, we're talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat. You have to get close to the fellow before your sword can have any effect on that person. And when you, when you consider 1 Samuel chapter 17 from verse 34 to 51, 1 Samuel 17 from verse 34 to 51, you find that uh, David engaged the lion in hand to hand combat, the bear in hand to hand combat. <laughs> when he came to Goliath, you have to stay away from that giant before you engage in any kind of combat at all. And so he has to send the projectile to go and deal with the enemy first before he can come close and then use the sword to finish the job. So the arrow, as you know, is a very, very good weapon of warfare because you stay safe and send the arrow on an errand. Uh, Psalm 7 verse 13, Psalm 7 verse 13 describes the arrow as an instrument of death against persecutors. In Psalm 18, from verse 13 to 14, Psalm 18, from verse 13 to 14, the, the Bible describes the arrow as a weapon used by the Almighty to scatter his enemies. So you discover from the fact that the arrow is always sent to the enemy. That there is a link between the arrow and the word of God. Psalm 107 verse 20. Psalm 107 verse 20 says, He sent his word and he healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. He sent the word to destroy sickness and to liberate those who are in bondage to destruction. In other words, 
it is clear that there is a link between the word of God and the arrow. And one other thing about the arrow that will show you of, of this correlation between the, the arrow and the word of God is the fact that the arrow can be used again and again. You send the arrow, it deals with the enemy, and then you can go ahead and pull out the arrow and use it again. Isaiah 55 from verse 10 to 11. Isaiah 55 from verse 10 to 11, the Almighty God made it clear that his word would not return to him void. It will achieve the purpose for which it is sent. So you can see that there is definitely there is a link between the arrow and the word of God so that when God was listening, I mean listening, the uh, armor of God and he mentioned the sword is simply using the sword as a representative of all offensive weapons. Now, for the arrow to be effective, you need to know that the arrow has two basic parts. The arrowhead, which is usually made of iron, and the shaft, which is made of hard wood. And the shaft is there to help the arrowhead fly to the object to be destroyed. The arrow the head of which is a uh, destructive weapon must be sharp so that it can pierce through the enemy and it can be a very effective weapon. In Second Kings chapter 9 verse 24, Second Kings 9 verse 24, you find the story of Jehu versus Jehoram. Jehoram was flying away, running away. Jehu sent the arrow. The arrow hit him at the back and came out in front. The arrow head did the job of piercing through the enemy. Now, the shaft helps the arrow head to fly straight to the mark. Lamentation chapter 3, verse 12. Lamentation chapter 3, verse 12 will tell you that the arrow must fly straight to the object meant for destruction. And so we need to know that for the arrow not to miss its mark, it must be well balanced. The head must not be tilted towards one side. The shaft must not be tilted towards one side. Everything must be well balanced. And so uh, it's you, and I'm sure when you two were talking about the mighty arrows, you are talking about yourself as a weapon of warfare that will be going out to destroy forces of darkness, to uh, lay hands on the sick, get them recovered, cast out demons, win souls, etc., etc. So as an arrow, you must be balanced. That's very, very crucial. Otherwise, you will not be effective. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 therefore tells you, Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 tells you you are to rightly divide the word of God. 
rightly divide the word of God, the arrow must be balanced, 100% balanced, not too heavy to the right, not too heavy to the left, balanced. The arrowhead, if you look at it very well, you will see that the shape of the arrowhead is like that of an aeroplane. One wing to the right, one wing to the left, and the two must be balanced. One engine on the right, one engine on the left, and the two engines must be the same weight. Otherwise, you have a problem. You look at the arrow, the shape of the arrow is like that of a bird. And if you find a bird with one, high, one wing gone, that bird is not going to fly. So what are we trying to say? You must go in to attack truly balanced in doctrine. Today, we have going through the old world the so-called gospel of grace. Now, everything about grace that people have been talking about could be correct. By grace, we are saved. No doubt about that. We are what we are by the grace of God. No doubt about that. But we have to balance grace with truth. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14. John 1, verses 1 and 14. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten son of the father full of grace and truth grace and truth the same John chapter 1 verse 17 John 1 verse 17 says the law came by Moses But grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. Your arrow must be balanced so that it can fly straight to the target. We are saved by grace so that all things can become new. Saved by grace so that all things can become new. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Second Corinthians 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things that pass away, behold, all things have become new. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Romans 6, 1 and 2 said clearly can we continue in sin that grace may abound? He answered in the strongest possible way God forbid. 2 Peter chapter 2 from verse 19 to 22 2 Peter 2 from verse 19 to 22 gave a warning thousands of years ago that there will be those who will promise us liberty. You know what liberty means? Freedom to do whatever you like. But he says they themselves will live in corruption. They will bring people back into bondage. Ah, 
And he says, backsliders are worse than those who were never saved. Because he says, to backslide is like a dog returning to his vomit. What's Peter say? Looking into the future, he saw the end of the days, the end of times. He saw what will happen just before the Lord returns. He saw that there will be people who will say to you, once you are saved by grace, you can do whatever you like. All you need to do is say the sinner's prayer. Lord, I am a sinner. I believe you are the Savior. You came to save my soul. I surrender to you today. Therefore, save my soul. In Jesus' mighty name. And then we say amen. And we all clap. We all rejoice that now you are a child of God. And they say, once you say that prayer, nothing can ever prevent you from entering to heaven. It doesn't matter what you do after that. That is not true. When you say, Lord, save my soul, I surrender my life to you, you are saying, by your grace from now, I'm committed to a life of purity, I'm committed to a life of holiness, I'm committed to a life that we do the will of God. If I deviate, if I go back to the life style that I was living before I met the Lord, before I prayed that prayer that leads to my salvation, I am like a dog going back to his vomit. Oh, grace is a wonderful wonderful doctrine but grace can be abused grace is very slippery you can fall from grace grace can be frustrated this is all, it's all there in the scriptures For your arrow to fly straight, you must have a balanced doctrine, balancing grace with holiness, balancing power with glory. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. There is the gift of God. There is the giver himself. The gifts of God are without repentance. But the giver can say bye-bye. Oh, they said, no, 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 no. Once God called you, once God has empowered you, you can now go ahead and do whatever you like. God will never throw away the child of God with the bath water. God, they said, will never leave you. It doesn't matter how you live. Uh, but he said, if you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. It's God who said that. They said, well, what is meant is that if you go back into a life of sin, if you are not as hot as you used to be, he will spew you out of his mouth to tell you, hey, you are not as hot as you used to be. Now, if you now, uh, after some time, 
it would be such a merciful God, such a gracious God. He will pick you up again and put you back in his mouth. Are you telling me God will return to what he has vomited? And let me begin to close. The success of the arrow is not only determined by being balanced. It is seriously determined by who is the one firing the arrow. If the one firing the arrow does not know how to do the job, the arrow will still not hit the mark. In Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 9, Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 9, the Bible tells us that the arrow must be in the hand of an expert mighty man. It is then that the arrow will not return vain. I don't know how to shoot an arrow. So no matter how well balanced the arrow may be, you put it in my hand, <laughs> I'm not likely to hit the mark. In 2 Kings chapter 4, from verse 18 to 34, 2 Kings 4, from verse 18 to 34, we discover that the rod of Elisha is useless in the hand of Gehazi. It's not the arrow now that will do the job. It is the one using the arrow. So you need to know, beloved children, as the arrow of the mighty, we have to determine who is the mighty who will be firing you. And the only person who can fly you straight and true all the time is the Holy Spirit. I will give you just one little example and give you an opportunity to pray. And that example is one young man like you who became an arrow, mighty one, and his name is Philip. In Acts chapter 6 from verse 1 to 6, Acts chapter 6 from verse 1 to 6, Philip was mentioned for the first time and one of his qualifications was full of the Holy Spirit. Completely in the hand of the Holy Spirit. And so, he flew to a city called Samaria. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 from verse 5 to 8. Acts 8 5 to 8. Samaria was a city of total darkness. All manners of evil were happening in Samaria in those days. But when this arrow arrived under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the Bible said, Demons hearing him speak were flying out. All manners of miracles were happening. Several souls were saved. And there was great joy in the city. As an arrow of the Almighty God, you were going into your uh, various campuses, into your various uh, societies to heal the sick, to cast out the demons, to save souls, to do mighty things for God, provided you are the one, you are being fired by the Holy Spirit. And then you need to take note of this arrow 
When you read Acts chapter 8 from verse 26 to 40, Acts 8 from verse 26 to 40, you find that this arrow is under the control of God. He doesn't get to Samaria and forget who sent him there. As successful as he was there, when the Almighty God said, now I want to leave the revival you are having here and go to the backside of the desert somewhere, the wilderness. His answer was, yes, Lord. The arrow does not dictate to the one who will shoot it. He got there. The man who had been preaching to a mighty crowd had to talk to one man gladly because one of these problems some of you are having and I believe that problem is already gone anyway in Jesus name is that when in the campus you are the leader of the group there and your group or some of them in the thousands and time comes to graduate. And then the Almighty God asks you to go and uh, pastor just one little parish of the redeemed Christian Church of God where there are less than 10 people. Uh, you say, oh, Me? Do you know how many people call me daddy on campus? And then you do one of the most interesting things that uh, someone who is not well grounded would do. You look for a ministry and you go and join yourself together with them. Not that you will get there and they will put you in charge of the ministry. Hey, here comes a great man of God from the campus, father of thousands, and then the leader of the ministry will say, you're welcome, I hand over to you. No, they, they don't even recognize your, your presence. And immediately you move away from the one who was shooting you at the arrow. You find yourself not too long after that where, where God will say, well, this fellow has decided to be shooting himself. Leave him alone. And suddenly you discover just little by little by little that your fire is dying. Suddenly you discover that you are now more amenable to the gospel of grace forgetting the truth. I hope you are hearing me loud and clear. You see, because after Philip obeyed the instruction of God and he met with the Ethiopian, you know, one man after leaving a city-wide successful crusade, the Bible says as that man was baptized and they were coming out of the river for the first time in the life of Philip he flew transported by the Holy Spirit to higher grounds because the next time we heard about him the boy who used to be a deacon had become an evangelist. If you want to succeed and a narrow of the most high God, pay attention to who is firing the arrow. He is the almighty. And he will send you wherever he wants many a times to give you solid background 
to develop your character. I stand before you today talking to you as an example with all humility of an arrow who has been in the hand of the Almighty. I've been flying and I'm yet to begin to fly. And I want you to follow my example. In one of our uh, money devotions, we learned that we must lead by example. But I told my children, you must also learn by example. That it is one thing to have someone who wants to lead you by example. It's another thing for you to learn by example. And I gave them the illustration of Elisha. He saw how Elijah crossed River Jordan, rolling his mantle together, smiting the water. He followed his example. When Elijah had gone, he took the mantle, he rolled it together the way his master did, he smote the water, and then said, All right, God, you are true to my father. I have followed his example. Be true to me. And God said, Amen. I told them, he learned from his father that when the son of the widow of Zarephath died, he laid on that child three times before the son came back to life. When the son of the Sunamite woman died, Elisha said, this is the way my father did it. He too laid on the child three times. And the child came back to life. For you to fly straight and hit your mark, do what Paul said. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Be ye followers of me as I am a follower of Christ. I was already the main preacher most of the Sundays at the headquarters church in the Butemeta. It's either my father is preaching and I'm interpreting for him, or he will sit down and ask me to preach. If he preached in the morning, I will preach in the evening. Then the Almighty God says, Son, you need to move. And I went to Elori. <laughs> And when I got to Eloni, ah, it was a big church, a little bigger than the choir at the headquarters. But I stayed there and I learned things that I would never have learned in Lagos. God groomed me, established my going, and put my steps firm on the rock. He brought me back to the headquarters. By the time he was bringing me back, it, it has to be the Lord. Otherwise, I wouldn't have come back because by then I don't want to go back to the headquarters anymore. I'm going to pray for you. But you will go to the Almighty God in prayer yourself after I've finished. It's been quality time in the Holy Spirit. You see, because one thing about the, about the arrow is that the arrowhead must have spent quality time in the fire before the blacksmith will beat it to the shape that he wants. And when the blacksmith puts it in the fire and it's red hot and he has done all the beating, he will bring it out Check whether it is balanced. If it's not satisfied, back into the fire. And I'm sure you are not as perfect as you should be yet. So you need to spend some more time in the fire of the Holy Spirit. Let me pray for you. 
My Father, my God, I'm committing your children this wonderful, wonderful arrows in all the institutions all over, committing them into your hands. I know it's not an accident that they chose the team, Mighty Arrows. It is because the Holy Spirit wants to speak to them and you want to turn them to vessels unto honor in your hands like never before. My Father, my God, I'm asking, whatever you need to put right in the lives of these, your children, so that they be balanced, so that they will fly straight, so that they will become what you plan for them to become. Please do it today. You may need to beat them hard with the hammer of your word. Go ahead and do it. Lord God Almighty, I pray that none of these arrows will miss the mark. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that the Holy Spirit will grab them and not let them go until finally they arrive in your kingdom to hear you say, well done. So let it be in Jesus' name. Lord, as they begin to cry unto you, I pray that the fire of the Holy Spirit will descend and you will do a marvelous work of purification in these children so that, Lord God Almighty, one day they will look back to this very simple message and say, thank God I heard this. Thank God it has done its work in my life. And thank God now I am where I am by the grace of God. Father, let it be the portion of your children and use them, Lord God Almighty, to bring millions of souls into your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you, children. I'm sure next year it will be virtual. I will see you at Redemption Camp in Jesus' name.